God, please kill me in my sleep tonight, was a phrase I repeated a lot. Throughout my teenage years, I had suffered from an undiagnosed major depressive disorder. Sad was my default state. If someone would ask, hey, what's wrong? I would reply with the lie, just tired, even though I wanted to cry. After I left for college in 2017, my mental health fell off a cliff. I didn't do well alone, adrift in a sea of 20,000 strangers, boomer sooner. Despite the team dominating Texas in football every year, I began to have suicidal thoughts every day. Tragically, however, I couldn't kill myself. My parents would be devastated after all. I knew I had won the natal lottery. What kind of son would I be to inflict terrible emotional damage on them? But a dastardly brain aneurysm? Those can happen to anyone. Why couldn't I be so unlucky? I hated my existence. I wished I hadn't been born. Fast forward six years to autumn 2023, and my outlook on life remained bleak. I had just moved to a brand new city for work where I didn't know anybody, my end table had got all scratched up in the U-Haul, and my cat Pax had gingivitis. Things were rough. After years of inadequate band-aid solutions, I was growing more discouraged that my mental health would ever improve. I didn't want to do this anymore. I was at the end of my rope. Then, after a particularly despondent phone call with my parents, they recommended a radical remedy. Mere months later, my depression and suicide ideation had vanished, yet to return. The once omnipresent storm clouds have parted from my mind, and finally, I have seen the sun. True, sometimes it rains and I get all wet, but I know I'll be warm and dry again. What was the catalyst for my considerable change in disposition? Not the six therapists, nor the two psychiatrists. A medley of brand named antidepressants helped, but I still begged for death. Seemingly, modern medicine had failed me. My parents' prescription? 100% legal, Stanford-studied, intravenous ketamine therapy. Right away, I had a question. Ketamine hydrochloride was first synthesized in 1962 by chemist Calvin Stevens. The American had been researching a replacement for the popular general anesthetic, fencyclidine, also known as PCP. This medicine often induces undesirable psychotic symptoms in patients post-operation. Stevens' new PCP analog lacked this flaw and was faster acting. In 1970, the Food and Drug Administration approved the compound for human consumption. Under the brand name Ketalar, it served as an injectable field anesthetic for American soldiers during the sunset years of the Vietnam War. Ketamine now graces the 2023 World Health Organization model list of essential medicines. Drugs on this list are considered safe, effective, and economical. Ketamine remains widely used in emergency medicine around the globe. Of course, humans are nothing if not curious. What happens if you don't take enough ketamine to knock you out? Subjective effects of a sub-anesthetic dose include sedation, pain relief, time distortion, physical euphoria, and hallucinations both visual and auditory. Don't forget dissociation, the detachment from the external world and even one's sense of self. Nicknamed Special K, ketamine was destined for recreational use. Though it proved popular in the American rave scene, party goers promptly perceived the problematic symptoms of persistent pill popping. Abuse of the drug may lead to dependence, both physical and psychological. Side effects of chronic ketamine use may include depression, memory impairment, psychosis, hallucinatory flashbacks, ulcers, liver failure, or incontinence. Ketamine can also cause dangerously fluid breathing or cardiac arrest. Rest in peace, Matthew Perry. What the report does say is that there was ketamine found in Matthew Perry's system and it was reported that he had been receiving ketamine infusion therapy to treat depression and anxiety. To be clear, Chandler Bing's demise was not due to his legal ketamine therapy. The drug has a half-life of three hours, and his last treatment was over a week prior. Perry perished after taking 26 intramuscular shots of the tranquilizer over five days at his Los Angeles home. He was found alone, floating face down in his hot tub, dead at 54. No other intoxicating drugs were found in his system. In his 2022 autobiography, the actor admitted to abusing alcohol and prescription drugs for most of his life, but was 18 months clean at the time the book was released. Your disease is just outside, just doing one-arm push-ups, just waiting, just waiting for you, waiting to get you alone. Because alone, you lose to the disease. 
giving Perry supervised ketamine treatment may have been safe medically, but it likely introduced a man with an affinity for addiction to the drug that ultimately killed him. Five people, including two doctors, have since been charged in connection with distribution of the dope. Back in the 20th century, appetite for the anesthetic endured. To supply this recreational demand, bandits began burgering hospitals and veterinary clinics for their stash. Medical personnel were even robbed at gunpoint. Something had to be done. In 1999, the Drug Enforcement Administration classified ketamine as a controlled substance. New regulations were placed on the drug's manufacture, importation, and distribution. From then on, ketamine was available by prescription only. Any persons who possess ketamine without the federal government's permission can face a prison sentence of up to 10 years or a fine of up to $500,000. As far as anyone was concerned in 1999, the only reason you should be taking ketamine was if you were a trauma patient or a horse. But that thinking was so last millennia. The new year marked the dawn of a new era in psychiatry. Soon, pseudoscience would perish to potent prescriptions. Throughout the 1990s, many American patients received this informational leaflet from their psychiatrists. It states, When serotonin is in short supply, you may suffer from depression. When you have enough serotonin, symptoms of depression may lift. Sadly, this is incorrect. In 2022, researchers at the University College of London released a groundbreaking systematic umbrella review on the serotonin theory of depression. They found there is no consistent evidence of an association between serotonin and depression. Such a link had long been speculated by scientists, but never confirmed. Lead author, Professor Joanna Moncrief, states, quote, It is always difficult to prove a negative, but I think we can safely say that after a vast amount of research conducted over several decades, there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by serotonin abnormalities, particularly by low levels or reduced activity of serotonin, unquote. This conclusion calls into question the prescription of modern antidepressant medication. Most of these drugs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. They're supposed to work by increasing the amount of serotonin available in the brain. There is no other accepted pharmacological mechanism by which these antidepressants affect the symptoms of depression. Plenty of people taking this medicine have experienced relief, but we don't know why. We do know that that leaflet was made by American drug maker Eli Lilly and Company. They, and much of the pharmaceutical industry, pushed the unproven chemical imbalance hypothesis for years. It was a profitable mistake. At the same time, Eli Lilly sold Prozac. The drug was the first SSRI available in the USA. From its FDA approval in 1987 to its loss of patent protection in 2001, it accounted for 30% of Eli Lilly's revenue roughly $40 billion in today's money. Also throughout the 1990s, the Yale University School of Medicine was researching ketamine. Dr. John Crystal directed the effort. He was interested in ketamine because it causes symptoms similar to the mental disorder he sought to study, schizophrenia. By administering ketamine to his subjects, the doctor desired to induce delusions and hallucinations. This he did successfully. However, some of Crystal's subjects reported that they were less depressed, sometimes for days after treatment. Were they still high? To find out, Crystal did what any good doctor should do. He found some sad people and gave them psychedelic drugs. In the year 2000, Yale researchers released the first randomized double-blind study into ketamine's antidepressive effects. Subjects with a major depressive disorder received a supervised single dose of ketamine hydrochloride at 0.5 mg per kilogram of body weight over 40 minutes. These individuals reported rapid relief from depression for up to three days after treatment. They're not tripping, yet they're still chilling. Ketamine-induced mood improvement returned to baseline levels one to two weeks after the infusion. How? What is the mechanism of action? Crystal's theory? Ketamine works because it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. Allow me to explain as briefly as possible. The sending and receiving of information in your brain is handled by nerve cells called neurons. Messages are transmitted from one neuron to another via chemical or electrical signals. The junction where two neurons meet is called a synapse. 
Brain scans show that social isolation and chronic stress reduce the number of synapses in the prefrontal cortex. This region of the brain handles higher mental functions, including emotional expression. In brains with synaptic deficiencies, ketamine stimulates new neuronal growth. More dendritic spines, more opportunity for connection and communication. It's at the synaptic level that receptor modulating drugs have their effect. Located in the receiving neuron is the star of the show, the NMDA receptor. Its primary role is to act as a channel for positively charged calcium ions. However, passage of the ion into the cell is not guaranteed. First, we need two neurotransmitters, glutamate and glycine. Both compounds need to be bound to an NMDA receptor for it to be open, allowing the calcium ion to enter the neuron. And yes, it must be these two compounds. Sometimes, bums like dichlorokinuretic acid try to sneak in. This acid competes with glycine for the same spot on the NMDA receptor. If the acid binds, the channel is closed to traffic. That makes dichlorokinuretic acid an NMDA receptor antagonist. Now, glycine can usually beat the antagonist to the binding site. However, research shows that chronic use of SSRIs weakens glycine's ability to compete. With this clinical debuff, the antagonist wins out over glycine. It binds to the receptor and the channel is shut. This matters because when an NMDA receptor closes, calcium ions build up outside the cell. After some time, the channel opens and the ions flood in. The sudden influx of these positively charged ions into the cell activates a chain reaction, resulting in the strengthening of the synapse. This process is key to memory formation and brain plasticity. If this is how antidepressants work, then what we need is a stronger NMDA receptor antagonist. Enter ketamine. It just comes in and straight up blocks a channel. The result is a higher concentration of calcium ions, causing a greater voltage variation when the channel eventually opens. Synapses have strengthened. New neuronal growth has been stimulated. This NMDA receptor antagonist theory is currently the best explanation for ketamine's effects. However, depression is complicated. Many factors affect the disorder, so ketamine could have multiple mechanisms of action. Scientific squabbling on the subject continues to this day. And here, finally, we come back to me. In 2019, my guilty pleasure was picturing what people's reaction would be if I ended my life. Oh my god, they'd exclaim, I should have appreciated Thomas while he was still around. Did I cause this somehow? Their worst fears would be confirmed when, just before my death, I would post a video telling the world about my long-concealed personal pain. I'd drop a few hints about who was responsible for my demise. I wouldn't name anyone outright, of course, but the proper people would know what they did. I wanted to weaponize my suicide despite those who I believed had wronged me. My suffering would end, and they would feel rotten. A win-win. Really, I should have just found someone I trusted and talked it all through. I didn't. I was ashamed of being sad, fueled by feelings of low self-worth. According to a 2023 systemic review, over half of people who had experienced suicidal ideation did not disclose so to others. Like me, they kept it to themselves, sometimes with fatal consequences. It took years and failing several engineering courses before I finally opened up to my parents. Both were, are, and always will be amazing. Soon, I was in talk therapy and on several SSRIs, but life was still a slog. Then, last year, my mom heard about a new drug therapy. She told my dad, they both did a bunch of research, and soon, he was texting me a Stanford School of Medicine study on ketamine. He asked, was I interested in intravenous ketamine therapy for depression? I said, why not? There are currently over 500 ketamine clinics in the United States offering treatment for mood disorders. Thankfully, there is one accepting new patients close by. My parents and I met with them, where mom and dad annoyingly asked every possible question. All I cared about was that there were three barriers to entry. First, I had to not be schizophrenic. Ketamine could make the condition worse. Second, I had to have treatment-resistant depression. Since I had been prescribed two or more unsuccessful antidepressant prescriptions, I had this condition. A phone conversation with a medical doctor confirmed it. Finally, the financial cost, $2,600. 
intravenous ketamine administration is not approved by the FDA to treat mood disorders. Its prescription for my depression would be off-label. Hence, health insurance providers wouldn't cover it. The clinic recommended six 40-minute ketamine sessions across two weeks. Out-of-pocket costs for these treatments came to around $2,600, a sum I would not spend on myself. Gratefully, my parents paid. It's safe to say it is the most meaningful gift anyone has ever given me. I was encouraged to speak with a therapist before my first session. I was reluctant to do so. Despite hyping up talk therapy to my peers, I had been largely unimpressed with the field. Of course, I had yet to meet Miriam. Like me, she had struggled with depression, but ketamine therapy had helped her. However, she was quick to inform me that efficacy was not guaranteed. Even if it did help, there were no silver bullets in mental health. I had to have realistic expectations and put in the work to better my brain. Miriam then reminded me of the importance of set and setting in a psychedelic trip. Set is the mental state a person brings to the table. If I went in with a stressed, frantic mindset, the experience would match. Setting is the physical environment in which one has the trip. Safety was key. Remember the unmonitored Matthew Perry? I would spend my time motionless in a private room, watched by medical professionals. They would be there to intervene if something went awry. The fix was in. I arrived at my inaugural ketamine session a tad apprehensive. I believed that this, like everything else, would be a band-aid solution. Prior to treatment, I was given Ondansetron for the nausea, Meclizine for the dizziness, and Tylenol to prevent pain from possible bladder spasms. We talked about how I was feeling and what my expectations are. Then, they stuck a needle in my arm, put a blanket over my body, covered my eyes with a sleep mask, and placed headphones over my ears. I was treated to a classical music playlist, featuring the very pieces you've heard in this video. The lights went dim, I heard, and off I dreamt. Earlier, Miriam had suggested that I not go into the session with a predetermined intention in mind. Rather, I should go with the flow, and not fight where the drug took me. So I breathed, in and out, and soon the ket kicked in. I was given 0.5 mg per kilogram, so visuals were slim. There were tiny holes in my sleep mask though, allowing in a bit of light. I imagined I was on my back in a field, looking up at the starry night sky. I completely forgot about my body. I was serene. I took a break from the worrying I hadn't realized was constant. Then, in what felt like no time at all, the infusion was complete. A short saline flush would clear out the IV tubing and prevent any arterial blockage. I walked out of the clinic 90 minutes after I entered, albeit far woozier than before. Mom drove me back to my apartment where I took a fat nap. Over the next two weeks, I had five more treatments with increasing dosage as prescribed. In one, I dreamt about a timeline of my major life events. Dissociating hard, I viewed them dispassionately. I saw how I was the product of experiences which were driven largely by forces external to me. All I could do was what I had done, respond the best I could. More so, I finally accepted everything that has happened to me in the past, even the pain. Looking back at the entirety of my life, the good and the bad, I smiled. Damn it, I want to live. I've literally never been happier. My depression is in complete remission. I get a ketamine booster every few months, but if I'm honest, I don't think I need them anymore. I realized engineering was making me miserable, so I'm going back to school to learn to teach math. I've also moved in with my brother, the kindest person I know. If you're considering seeking out ketamine, please remember the following. 1. Avoid telehealth ketamine services. Medical monitoring can only be done in person. 2. Find a reputable clinic. Thank you, Quad Cities Ketamine Clinic, for keeping me safe. 3. Do post-trip integration with a competent therapist. Miriam has helped me through a lot of my garbage. 4. Ketamine may not work for you. If it doesn't, don't give up hope. There are other treatment options, but also consider the following. A theme I've noticed while making this video is being alone is bad for humans. It was my friends that made my existence bearable all those years. Now that my brain has healed, 
They make my life glow spectacularly. It is our relationships with others that make life worth living.